Hi everyone, thank you for joining today. Uh, my name is Callie and I'll be guiding us through a discussion of key concepts in the Illumina sequencing data analysis. Uh, this talk is an intro to general concepts that can be applied to Illumina sequencing data, but it also extends beyond Illumina into the broader realm of bioinformatics. Later, we'll discuss available Illumina tools that can assist us in data analysis and the goals that we want to achieve with that. So let's get started. Before we dive in, here is a brief overview of where we're going to go through this webinar. First, we want to discuss experimental design and considerations that will ultimately drive our analysis approach. Then, we'll jump into key bioinformatics concepts. Here, we'll define the basic approaches and gain a high-level understanding of standard bioinformatics methodologies, why they're important, and how they might differ. Lastly, we'll discuss available Illumina platforms and software solutions that will enable us to perform bioinformatics data analysis both locally and on the cloud. One thing that I want to mention is that this presentation is meant to orient you to general considerations, concepts, and tools for a successful Illumina next generation sequencing experiment. Um, you should always make sure to consult the literature and methods in your particular field to dictate your actual experiment. The scientific community sets the standard. We just want to provide a high-level overview and context of what's available. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about experimental design. A well-thought-out experiment can really help you downstream. And even before going into the lab and preparing samples, you should know what analysis approach and what software that you'll be using. So let's consider this a bit further. At a primary level, every Illumina sequencing experiment consists of three steps. The first of which is planning our experiment. We then move on to our actual sequencing experiment. And finally, the fun part, we conduct our data analysis. So when designing an experiment, how exactly are you defining the hypothesis to be tested? This is really important because the answer will change every downstream step and it'll drive our overall planning. It's also important to know what sequencer that we'll be using or what is available to us. So while each instrument, instrument provides genomic data in the form of reads, they can differ a lot in how the data is output as well as the amount of data that's output. So for example, a NovaSeq will produce a lot more data than an iSeq and a MySeq can produce longer read lengths than the next seq. Last, but certainly not least, you'll want to consider what software to use for your analysis. This is really important because it'll ultimately help answer your hypothesis. So when it comes to software options, you'll want to know things like, is it a command line program or a GUI interface? If it's a command line, you'll likely need to have access to a Linux server. If it's GUI, then you'll likely need a PC with a lot of RAM and storage. We also need to know how much data we're going to need and what the input requirements are. Will our software expect paired end reads or will single reads suffice for our experiment? We also need to know things about the read length and which read length might be appropriate for our experiment. And finally, is the software looking for other input files, such as a manifest, or is it looking for output files from a different software or program? So for more design and planning considerations, I invite you to view this additional helpful webinar, which gives a more detailed look at planning a new sequencing project. Alrighty, let's consider how much data we need for an experiment. Well, you might know that the answer depends, right? So here, we want to illustrate that the application and scope of an experiment drives how much data we need. Factors like genome size, application, and power of detection all matter in determining how much data we'll need to answer a hypothesis. So for example, when we consider genome size, a smaller genome will require fewer total reads than a larger genome. The type of application can also greatly affect the amount of data that is required. 
uh, and we'll learn more about each of these later in the presentation. Lastly, power of detection can greatly change the amount of data that we need, um, as can be the case when we're detecting germline variants, which require a lower power of detection, versus somatic variant calling, which requires a higher power of detection. Okay, so to gain more perspective, let's consider the question how much data is required with a couple of rough numbers and examples. So we can think about a human resequencing experiment, in which case we're looking at germline variants, um, and for that we would need somewhere between 10 to 30x coverage. So let's just use 30x for our, this example. Uh, we know that the human genome is 3.4 gigabases, uh, so if we multiply that by 30x coverage, we'll need approximately 100 gigabases of data. Now, for comparison, let's consider the exact same type of experiment, but this time with a different species, Arabidopsis. Since the genome is much smaller, only about 0.125 gigabases, we only need about 3.75 gigabases of data for the same type of experiment. Now, let's consider a different application, but use the same two species that we mentioned before. For a de novo assembly, we'll want to increase the coverage to somewhere around 70x. By doing so, we'll need more data than we did for a resequencing experiment. Of course, there's a big gap between the two species, but really what we want to take note of is the increase of data that we need just by changing the application. Finally, let's think about RNA-seq or gene expression experiments. Uh, again, we'll consider the human species as uh, our example. Um, since our goal is to analyze transcript expression, the genome size isn't really taken into account and the coverage will depend on the sensitivity that we're looking to obtain. However, we can say that we'll need about five to 100 million reads per sample for this example. So you've heard me broadly mention coverage. I'm not gonna talk about how to decide what coverage is right for your experiment, but I will link you uh, to our coverage calculator in the resources section of this presentation. Alrighty. So before we discuss types of reads and read length, let's define a read. A read uh, is the data that comes from a single cluster on the flow cell. Uh, this is the actual genomic sequence that's found for a particular sample. It would look something like this uh, in the slide here. This read is 50 bases long, which means that it would take 50 cycles from the sequencer to produce this piece of information about a specific sample. In this illustration, we're showing that as, cluster, as a cluster lights up, the sequencer is able to determine what base is present at a given cycle. So during fast queue generation, we're able to put all of the cycle information together to form reads. Reads are stored in fast queue files. Uh, demultiplexing refers to assigning reads to the correct samples based on the index or index combinations for those samples. Uh, later on, I'll discuss the structure of FASTQ files, especially since they are input to many of our analysis workflows. So now that we've defined what a read is, let's talk about single versus paired end reads. In the following examples, I'll arbitrarily select uh, 100 base pairs as the length that we're looking at. Single reads probe the insert in one direction from five prime to three prime. You may recall that during library preparation, we flank, we flank the insert with adapter sequences on both ends. The insert is the portion of DNA that comes from the organism of interest and should not include the adapter sequence. I say should not here because if the insert is smaller than 100 base pairs, you may actually sequence adapter. On the other hand, if the insert is longer than 100 base pairs, then you'll only sequence up to those 100 base pairs and miss sequencing the remainder of the insert. In that case, a longer read length, such as 125 or 150 bases, may be beneficial. So next, let's think about paradin reads. When using paradin reads, we'll sequence in the five prime to three prime direction, and then after a turnaround chemistry, we'll also sequence in the three prime to five prime direction. 
Essentially, we're reading towards the middle of the insert here. Uh, typically, we sequence symmetrically, meaning that read one and read two will be the same length. In our example case, it'll be 100 base pairs. Uh, there are a few exceptions to this, but normally the uh, read length is the same for each read, for read one and read two. Alrighty, the last scenario we can have is paired and with overlap. For this example, we'll change the read length to 200 base pairs. The insert could be around 300 bases, and with a read length of 200, there would be a 100 base pair overlap region between bases, base position 100 and 200. You may want to do this in an effort to cover a region further, but you may not want this if your analysis pipeline can't handle that overlap. Deciding what kinds of reads you need will depend on the pipeline that you plan to use and its requirements. So now that we've discussed the types of reads, let's talk about a few applications for the different types. For SMP detection or simple resequencing, we can use either paired end or single end reads. The key factor here really is the depth of coverage. So one intrinsic advantage of paired end reads is that you get twice as much data if the reads don't overlap. However, this may not be required of your experiment. If you do get enough data from a single 100 base pair read, let's say, then it's not necessary to use paired end. Switching over to insertion deletion detection or structural variant detection, paired end reads are what work best. As we move away from point features like in SMP detection, the structural features get much bigger. Paired end is the better choice to detect those big changes. So features in this category can be two, 20, or even 200 nucleotides in size. So having your read pair can really help us determine how that sequence is arranged. Similarly, we'll also want paired end reads for de novo assembly. In this application, we're essentially putting a big puzzle together and determining how all of the reads go together to make a genome. Having information like how close or far read one and read two are from each other can really be useful in figuring out a novel genome sequence. Moving on to RNA-seq or expression analysis, we can use either paired end or single reads. Older algorithms may not support paired end reads, However, if you're looking to detect fusions, paired end reads is what's required. Paired end reads can also be useful when looking at novel transcripts and investigating exon-exon boundaries. Once again, here's an example of where the software selection and application is important in our planning. <clears throat> Lastly, for small RNA differential expression applications, we really only need single reads. The main reason is that small RNA is typically only 30 to 40 nucleotides in length, and it's so small that you wouldn't need paired ends. Reading fully in the forward and then fully in the reverse would not give you any new information. So single reads are all you really need. So we've talked a little bit about read length, but let's consider this a bit further. The main takeaway here is that different features in different applications work best with certain read lengths. We've already discussed these applications, so it's no surprise that smaller read lengths work best for small RNA and RNA expression. In the middle range from approximately 50 to 100 base pairs in length, we're seeing RNA and resequencing applications um, for which these are, uh, this length is appropriate. And um, also within this range, we get a good amount of data between the 75 and 125 base pair range uh, for uh, aligning to the human reference. At 150 base pairs or greater, we can start detecting indels and structural variants quite nicely. We can do de novo assembly as well and probably go a little longer than 150 base pairs in this case, since most de novo assembly algorithms tend to work better with longer reads. The longer length is also useful for structural analysis of genes and gene annotation because you can look at larger, larger chunks of DNA and determine how things are rearranged or particularly structured. Again, these, these figures are general guidelines meant to acquaint you with when to use read lengths. 
the scientific journals or papers that you are reading uh, will be your main resource for a particular experiment that you plan to perform. Okay, so with all of the experimental design considerations behind us, let's get to the main portion of this talk, which is a discussion of key concepts in biomatics analysis. Uh, of course, there are several flavors of analysis that could be performed. However, we're looking to discuss basic concepts like alignment, variant calling, assembly, and RNA-seq analysis. So at this point, we've planned our experiment, we sequenced, and we have our reads. We're getting into the fun stuff, which is performing our analysis. So in this section, we will discuss FASTQ file overview, resequencing applications, both whole genome sequencing and targeted resequencing, uh, different assembly applications, as well as RNA sequencing. Alrighty. The first file and input to pretty much all analysis pipelines is a FASTQ file. The FASTQ for a sample will contain all of the reads sequenced for that sample and will look something like the figure you see in this slide. Each read contains four lines of information. Uh, here, we're looking specifically at three reads. The first thing to notice is the header on the first line of each read uh, that's shown. The at symbol tells us what instrument was used. In this example, a high seq was used. We also get information like the run ID, the flow cell ID, lane, tile, XY coordinates, and filter information for the read. The last entry on the first line has the index sequence that's shown in this blue box here. Uh, this, is, this example is a single index read. If it was a dual index read, it would look like this. The next line is the actual genetic sequence that's read from the instrument. This is the most important piece of information, and it'll be, what, it'll be the sequence that gets aligned, assembled, or whatever the downstream analysis plans are. Uh, the next line that follows is a delimiter, and the character here is always a plus symbol. The last line shown here is the actual quality score shown in an encoded format. Each character that matches up with the corresponding base call has an associated ASCII 2 number. Uh, we then subtract 33 from that number to obtain the FRED score for that base call. <clears throat> this example only shows three reads. However, an actual FASTQ file will contain millions, possibly even billions of reads, depending on your design considerations. If you take the number of reads and multiply that by the read length, you obtain the number of base pairs. For this example, we have three reads times a length of 66, which means we have 198 base pairs of data. <clears throat> now that we understand what's in our FASTQ file, let's talk about resequencing applications. Resequencing applications refer to alignment or mapping the reads to a reference genome. After alignment, we then perform variant calling or detecting where the samples differ from a reference genome. When we say resequencing, we typically refer to whole genome or whole exome sequencing. Targeted resequencing, like in Applicon or enrichment workflows, refers to performing alignment and variant calling on a specified region or regions of the genome. A typical resequencing workflow will follow the, this diagram, where we start with FASTQ files as an input that get aligned to a reference genome. We obtain from there the BAM files upon which we do variant calling, um, and we get those calls through a BCF or GBCF file. Let's talk a little bit about alignment. This is the first step in resequencing applications. Uh, as mentioned in the last slide, alignment refers to taking sample reads, and mapping them back to the reference genome. Once alignment completes, you'll have BAM files as an output. The .BAM ex extension designates the sample file as a binary alignment mapping file. Alignment can be computationally expensive because of the number of reads to align. In one of the earlier examples, we calculated that some experiments may produce millions or even billions of reads. And that's a lot of reads to map. 
So a good aligner must be able to handle this scale of data. Additionally, aligners need to make decisions about reads that might align to more than one region. Reads will also have variation due to DNA features or multiple variants in a sample. This can be tricky for aligners to handle since the goal is to map back to a region. So the better the match, the more likely a read will get assigned. Finding where the samples are different is also important, and the aligner needs to be able to map to the correct region even when there's high variability. Alrighty, to understand the alignment task a little further, let's consider this simple example. Here, let's say our reference genome is the sentence that you see on this slide. Aligners might place a short sequence in many places in the genome sequence. So if we have short reads like in and n, they might get aligned here, but they also can get aligned here. If we increase the length, the read length, and get the reads in underscore z and enome, we can see that these reads only align to one spot here. But increasing the length may not always be the answer. If we increase and get reads place and sequence, those reads could align here, but they can also align here. In this case, paired in reads may be more appropriate. So, here we have a paired in read in place, and that paired in read can only align in one spot here. Lastly, for this example, aligners need to determine what to do with variation. So, in this example, we have the read placed. Uh, you can see that that read is nowhere in the reference. However, this read might fit here if there's a deletion of the letter D, or it can align here if we have an S and P that results in a change from S in the reference to D in the sample. Now that we have an understanding of alignment, let's briefly talk about targeted alignment. Just as a quick reminder, we use targeted alignment in experiments where we only want to consider certain regions of the genome, like in amplicon analysis. Let's say you have a reference genome, like the example we have on this slide here, but your experiment is designed in a way that you're only interested in two regions, shown here with the red oval. The leftmost region may look like this, where it's only about 30 bases long. The rightmost reference region may then look like this, and it has a length of 50. In this, example, experiment, in this example experiment, we don't care about other areas of the genome. We're only interested in these two regions. We already mentioned that reads could align to more than one region in the reference. So how can we ensure that our aligned read results only fall within our targeted regions of interest? The answer is we use a manifest file to filter out alignment results to show us only the reads that fall within those target regions. I don't want to get into the weeds with the manifest file, uh, but we do want to provide a quick example of the key information that is included in a manifest file to help with targeted alignment. We'll need to have an indication of the reference genome that we're aligning to. Uh, in this example, we're using HG19. We'll also want position information like chromosomes, as well as the start and stop coordinates. Lastly, we'll need reference sequence information to match up to our targets. After we complete our alignment and use our manifest to determine our reads on target, we can visualize our data like this. In this visual, uh, we see our paired in reads, uh, where our forward read, or R1, is shown in red, and our reverse read, or R2, is shown in blue. The read pair is aligning to one of the target regions, um, we actually see that several pairs are aligning to the target region in this example. Uh, so now that we have this set up, we're ready to discuss the next step in resequencing applications, which is variant calling. We already alluded a bit to variant calling in the previous examples. Uh, here we're going to dig in a little deeper. 
After completing alignment, we want to understand where the samples are different from the reference sequence. We can have small point differences like in SMPs or larger deletion assertions of full sequences. We want to make sure that we're detecting these variations as much as possible in our samples. The output files are BCFs, also known as variant calling files, and GBCFs for, gen uh, for genome BCF files. The difference in the two is that the VCF will only contain information on variants identified, whereas GVCFs will include information for all positions, including where the sample matches the reference, known as a ref call. Considerations for variant calling include depth or coverage, meaning how many times have you sequenced the region where the variant is found. Um, and as you would expect, the higher the coverage, the more certain we are of the variant. We also want to know if we're looking at low frequency variants like cancer variants or germline variants. And then uh, once we have our variants, we want to annotate or understand information about them and then interpret or make determinations about what the variant means based on the annotation and, of course, your experiment. Let's think about coverage for a moment. Uh, as we said, the greater coverage, uh, greater coverage increases the confidence that we have that the sample sequence is correct. In this example, we have a reference in gray and our sample reads in blue. So we've located a variation in the position shown here in red, uh, where we have a C instead of a reference A. Since the depth of coverage is one, we, can be sh we can't be sure if this is a variant. It could very well be an SMP, but it could also be a sequencing error or even a read that was not aligned to the correct region. To be certain, we would need more data or reads to come to a conclusion. Alrighty, now we have this scenario. Again, we have the reference in gray and our reads in blue. Now we have a coverage depth of four, and we're seeing that C is being called more times. We can now be more sure that that C is the correct call and that a variant is actually present. This would be appropriate for a germline or SMP case. So let's take a look at a somatic case. Now we have the same setup as before, but instead we have just one read showing the C while the other reads are displaying an A or a ref call. If you're using a germline variant caller, this C may be disregarded and it would not be called an SMP. But if your study is looking at low frequency variables like in cancer tissue biopsy, this read with a C call might be an important data point. Uh, again, this depends on your study design and understanding of the software. In this case, the variant caller that's being used. Let's now switch gears and talk about de novo assembly. For de novo assembly, we're looking to build a reference genome or understand how the genome of an organism may be arranged. Our output files will be FASTA files. Um, these may contain a range of contexts. With assembly, it's important to understand that you may not get one continuous genome in the first try. Assembly is an iterative process and could take several attempts and parameter adjusting before obtaining a reference. Considerations will include the approximate size of the genome that you're working with, the continuity of the contigs obtained, and the organism. By organism consideration, we mean, are you expecting for the genome to have a single chromosome, like for bacterial species, or will it have multiple chromosomes? Of course, an organism with several chromosomes will result in more contigs. However, this can also be the case for a single chromosome organism. During library preparation of de novo assembly experiments, we expect to fragment the DNA in such a way that we will obtain a variety of insert sizes. The mix of long and short inserts will help us better cover the genome. The longer inserts will, need, will be needed to help create a backbone, while the shorter ones allow us to sequence the middle regions of the longer inserts that we missed. As we expect, the FASTQ files for each sample 
will contain reads from all regions of the genome. This makes it even more important to have paired in reads or a complementary read two for each read, read one to better assist with the assembly task. The FASTQ files will then run through the assembly program, which will align the reads in a sequential manner. We'll then get a FASTA file, which contains the assembled genome or contigs to better understand how the reads go together to form a genome. I do want to clarify that this is a simplistic model just for example purposes. To get a genome assembled into a continuous FASTA, it's really important that you consider the literature available and abide by specific parameters used to get the best results. <clears throat> now, let's think about a completely different experiment and talk a little bit about RNA-seq. There are many types of questions that can be answered with an RNA-seq experiment, but most commonly, we're looking to measure expression and abundance. Here is a brief um, or a high-level diagram of the process where we obtain our sample, extract RNA, convert it to cDNA, construct a library, and then sequence. Once sequencing is complete, we, co we obtain FASTQ files. In the most common case, we're looking to find gene expression. This equates to how abundant a particular gene is as opposed to another for a particular sample. The sample could be the same sample at different times after a treatment. For instance, we could take a plant at time zero and then add a chemical or treatment and measure which genes are expressed half an hour, an hour, and two hours after treatment. Basically, we're counting what genes are expressed or not expressed over time for the plant sample after we've added the chemical or the treatment. Just like resequencing experiments, RNA-seq begins with alignment. However, alignment is done a bit differently. So let's say we're looking at a transcript. In this case, the gray line in this figure uh, is still the reference, but the boxes represent the exons that we're interested in. During alignment, we want to align to only the exons, so the intronic regions will be removed. So single reads can align to a single exon, like in this example here. Uh, from that, we know that this first exon is present, and so is the second one with two reads aligning to it. We can also have single reads that span two exons. Uh, this branching can indicate a deletion of the intronic region. With paired in reads, we get information like an insert where read one aligns to one exon and read, one, read two aligns to uh, the other exon. Also, we can see an instance where read two spans an exon exon boundary. Ultimately, we'll get information about how many hits you can get on an exon, and also we'll learn about exon exon boundaries or exon association from paired and reads. Lastly, once your alignment is in place, regardless of whether single or paired and reads were used, we need to count the hits to answer our questions. So let's talk about how to do that. So there's a couple of ways that we can uh, count expression. Uh, here I'll be going through the simplest. So let's say we have the scenario here where our treated sample has a depth of five for each exon and the control has a depth of two. Uh, that's only part of the story though. So Let's say for the treated sample, we get 50 million reads, and for the control, we have 10 million reads total. We need to normalize them if we're going to compare them. We can normalize by million of read, millions of reads. In this case, for the treated sample, we divide our depth by millions of reads and get 0 0.1. If we do the same for our control, we get 0 0.2. So even though at a first glance, we see more coverage and reads in the treated group, when we normalize, we actually observe half the expression levels for treated versus the control. Normalization is a very powerful tool, uh, and most RNA-seq software will do this automatically. In this case, we would do this between samples. Uh, now, let's look at another case. In the previous case, we were looking at ways to compare sample to sample. Now, we want to compare transcripts from within the same sample. So 
here we have an example where there are three different genes, uh, each of different sizes, two kilobases, one kilobases, and three kilobases. If we throw in our aligned reads, we get raw read counts of four, five, and nine reads respect respectively. Um, but like the previous example, that's not enough because we need to normalize. We can standardize by read length, where four divided by two is two, five divided by one is five, and nine divided by three is three. And so now we've normalized by transcript length within a single sample. Lastly, let's talk about how these two methods are combined and used for normalization. Reads per kilobase of exon per million of mapped reads, commonly known as RPKM, takes into account reads mapped and length of the transcript for normalizing single reads. Fragments per kilobase of exon per million of mapped reads, or FPKM, normalizes in the same manner as RPKM, but it's specific to paradigm reads. Since RPKM and FPKM are normalized in the same way, uh, these counts can be used to compare samples with, uh, with each other. Transcripts per million of mapped reads, or TPM, is a different method that can accommodate either single or paradigm reads. Overall, RNA-seq fragment counts can be used as a measure of relative abundance of transcripts. For more information about RNA-seq analysis, we have an entire webinar covering that topic. Uh, I'll link you up to in the resources section to those slides. Alrighty, um, we finished off our intro to key concepts in bioinformatics. Uh, like I said earlier, there are lots of other analysis methods that we didn't cover, um, but our goal here is just to get a picture of the basics. So now let's look into some Illumina tools and solutions that'll help us in the analysis process. Let's briefly talk about Local Run Manager, more commonly known as LRM. LRM is a service that runs in the background of the Windows operating system. LRM is present on board the iSeq, MiniSeq, MySeq, and NextSeq 500 550 instruments. LRM can also be used off instruments when installed on a PC that meets all of the computing requirements and can be used to analyze data from any of the benchtop instruments that I just mentioned. LRM uses modules to perform data analysis. Here, we're only showing a few modules, but more can be found on our LRM support website. There are modules for all types of applications, including resequencing, targeted resequencing, assembly, and several others. Modules do need to be downloaded and installed separately as needed. We have a few links here to get you started with LRM, including installation and module guides. If you'd like more information, we also have an LRM recorded webinar that can be viewed at any time. BaseSpace Sequence Hub is our cloud-based solution. To access BaseSpace, you'll need to create a basic account at basespace.illumina.com. Once you're on the main dashboard page, you'll navigate to the apps to view all of what BaseSpace has to offer. Once in the apps page, you'll see that there's a variety of Illumina, BaseSpace Labs, as well as third-party apps. Illumina apps have icons with a blue background. Uh, base space labs also have um, apps, sorry, base space lab apps also have that blue background. The only difference here is that base space lab apps also have a little flask in the top right corner of those icons. Uh, typically, 30 third party apps have unique icons in a variety of color um, that you can find on the apps tab. So on base space, you'll find Illumina apps that are very similar to MySeq reporter workflows and local run manager modules. Uh, and they'll perform a variety of tasks like the ones that we talked a little bit about earlier. We also have a few links to get you started with BaseSpace. And just like um, LRM, there's a recorded webinar that guides you through BaseSpace and all of its features. Those resources will be linked uh, in the resources section of this presentation. Next, let's briefly talk about the Dragon platform that Illumina offers, 
Um, broadly, uh, here are the various analyses pipelines that Dragon offers, including the ability to process base calls or BCLs into FASTQ files at a greatly accelerated rate compared to conventional CPU-based demultiplexing and FASTQ generation. Additionally, Dragon can also align and quantify RNA-seq data and perform methylation analysis, such as whole genome bisulfite sequencing applications. Dragon is also great for mapping and aligning, and aligning uh, DNA sequences to perform various types of variant calling, including somatic calling for acquired rare variants, as well as germline variant calling. Our NextSeq 1K2K integrates the Dragon platform suite on board and offers many more tailored analysis pipelines, including the Dragon Applicon analysis, COVID seq analysis, Dragon enrichment, Dragon FASTQ generation, Dragon RNA, single cell RNA, um, and the GAPK germline. We also have additional Dragon pipelines available in base space. So just to conclude, um, we talked a little bit about, um, in the beginning of this webinar, about the design and planning considerations that we need to account for before even starting our experiment. We need to think, think about things like the amount of data that we need to be able to start out with, whether or not our data or our reads will be um, single read or paired end. Uh, we also want to take into consideration the read length that we're hoping to get. We talked a little bit about um, the analysis concepts uh, regarding resequencing, both for alignment and variant calling. We discussed very broadly the de novo assembly um, analysis concept as well as RNA-seq. And we finished off with what Illumina solutions we have for data analysis. And we have those both for on-instrument analyses via local run manager, uh, we have cloud options through base space sequence hub. We also have the availability of the Dragon BioIT platform, as well as the onboard or uninstrument NextSeq 1K2K Dragon pipelines. So here are the links that I uh, promised you for additional resources regarding coverage, a little bit more about FASTQ files and demultiplexing resources. Um, we also have additional recorded webinars that I mentioned. You can find in the le links here. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to attend this webinar today.